John, uh, one thing John didn't mention was that uh, his talent uh, and compassion helped change the trajectory of my son's life. Uh, John was a cross country coach at Kingwood High School and uh, turned my son uh, into a state champion. And it just has affected everything that he's done since. Uh, and I hope that if you listen closely enough to him, he can change the trajectory of your lives too. Having said that, um, today is September 2nd, and this is exactly 1,830 days since Hurricane Harvey first hit Houston. Um, it would have been uh, earlier in the week. Uh, Harvey lasted for about four or five days as it slimed this area. and. Um, Along the way, it dumped 54 inches of rain. Uh, how many of you in the audience flooded during Harvey? Looks like about a half to two thirds. Um, were any of you going to this college when it flooded? Okay, so some folks around the, the edge. Um, <clears throat> Let me uh, define a couple terms that I'm going to use before we get into this. One is the, the word flood mitigation. Does everybody know what mitigation is? Mitigation means to lessen the severity of something, okay? In the, the world of flood assistance, it's divided into two main parts. The first part is recovery, and the second part is mitigation. In the recovery world, the governments grant money to help people repair their homes. It's very much focused on individuals. But in the mitigation world, the focus of the money is on lessening the severity of future floods. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. The photo you see up on the screen is a photograph uh, looking south from the, uh, I think it's the, uh, the overpass uh, on Sorters McClellan Road that crosses 59 towards the Costco over in Humble. And that whole area uh, flooded in front of you. The question most people ask me is, are we safer now than we were then? Well, there's no simple answer to that question. Um, what I'd like to do today is take you through, first of all, what happened, then talk about why it happened, and then talk about mitigation. So first of all, what happened? If you go into the Harris County flood warning system and you look at the historical section for each of the gauges that you see there, you could compile a graph like this on your own. Uh, basically what I did was I went in and I looked at the Harvey Peaks uh, at each of the gauges in the northern part of Harris County and uh, compiled this graph. And guess what? The four gauges over on the left-hand side all are from the northern part of Harris County. And the one on the, on the leftmost side there is um, at 59 and the West Fork, just about a mile south of us, maybe not even that. So we got 22 feet of water above flood stage at that gauge. That's incredible. That was, depending on how you define worst, the worst flooding in Harris County. Now, you may have heard the phrase worst first. I'm going to talk about that a little more later on. That's how the Harris County commissioners are divvying up the flood mitigation money that voters approved in the 2018 flood bond, supposedly by worst first. I'll come back to that again.
The damage we had as a result of that flooding was among the worst in the county. Uh, we're in that uh, peak in the upper right-hand side of Harris County, which you can see there, over by the, the Y in the word county. And we're in that dark red area that includes Huffman, Kingwood, Atascacita, and Humble. And uh, there aren't many areas in the county that were bigger than that. The, um, that area, uh, since 1979, which is what this flood map represents, they call this a heat map, by the way, because it shows you where the worst damage was, uh, dates back to 1979. But in Harvey alone, we had 16,000 homes flood, 3,300 businesses, 13 people in Kingwood died as a result of the flood. Lone Star College, where you're sitting right now, was under all that water that we just talked about. Kingwood High School flooded to the second floor, and as a result, they had to rip out all of the ventilation systems in the school and replace them because they got infected with uh, black water, which is sewage infested water. Um, the uh, uh, Kingwood Town Center uh, flooded. 100% of all the businesses in Kingwood Town Center were underwater. Uh, the 59 bridge uh, southbound into town was, uh, was knocked off its base. Basically, the, the supports were scoured and it became unstable. They had to rip it out and start over again. The railroad bridge that parallels 59 collected all kinds of trees that were coming down river, and uh, that formed a kind of like a beaver dam in the middle of the river, and that backed water up even farther than it would have otherwise. And um, they had to tear that whole bridge down and start over with wider supports to allow trees to go through in the future. Uh, the Westlake Houston Bridge was uh, lifted off its foundation and. The panels were all a kilter. And the whole Deerbrook Mall area across the river was underwater. Uh, I don't know how much of the mall itself was damaged, but all the businesses around it, the big box stores opposite 59, all the way up to 1960 were damaged. The Umbel ISD lost its instructional support center and its administration building over there. It was bad. All the grocery stores pretty much were out of business for a long time. Uh, the gas stations, you couldn't find gas to pump because they were all damaged too. Uh, it was a mess for months and months, and we never want that to happen again, and that's what this talk is all about. Here's a picture of the Union Pacific Bridge over the West Fork while it was being reconstructed. Those of you who have lived here for a while may remember the old uh, cross-beam telephone pole supports that it used to have that were real close together. Well, it now has wider concrete supports that will let uh, trees pass through and not back water up in the future, hopefully. Here's a picture of the southbound lanes of uh, I-69. Um, they had to be completely torn out by TxDOT. Uh, the disruption to traffic and the detours lasted about 11 months, and that was they finished ahead of time at 11 months. So you can imagine the disruption to people who commuted downtown to work. Uh, this is one of 88 townhomes in the Forest Cove area, uh, down below Hamlin on uh, Marina and Timberline Drives. Uh, they bore the direct brunt of Harvey, which was sending 240,000 cubic feet of water per second down the West Fork. Imagine the force that that exerted on these buildings. It just went right through them. It blew out the doors, it blew out the windows, uh, and people were lucky to escape with their lives. I've interviewed three people who lived down there and one had to be rescued in a uh, uh, first responder lifeboat. And uh, they got her out seconds before the building collapsed. 
and floated away into Lake Houston. Wow. Here's a typical Kingwood home. You know, water uh, damaging everything that wasn't elevated up off the floor. Uh, you know, again, 16,000 homes like this in the area. Now, the 16,000 includes the whole Lake Houston area, so that includes Huffman and, you know, uh, places in the East Fork watershed still in Kingwood, plus the West Fork watershed. Um, it, it's more than just Kingwood itself. Here's Kingwood Town Center. By, uh, you can see the Whataburger in the background there. Uh, water up to the top of the windows, uh, as well as the uh, top of the windows along the lower floors of those uh, restaurants on the building at the right. Uh, uh, the HEB in that shopping center was under 13 feet of water, if I remember correctly. Uh, some of the, this is another lady who was lucky to escape with her life. She had to be rescued by the Cajun Navy from the third floor of her condo down by uh, Kings Harbor. Kingwood Village Estates is the area behind the old Randalls or the new Ace Hardware. Um, it's uh, basically a retirement community and uh, most of the people who live there are age 65 to 95. And the 12 deaths were among people who were evacuated um, and suffered injuries during the evacuation. Six of those 12 died uh, directly as a result of their injuries and another six died later when they came back to their homes and found them destroyed. It's really hard to start over when you're 95 years old. Here's your one and only Lone Star College. Um, you may recognize this sign down here by the uh, driveway on uh, Kingwood Drive. This is Hamlin Road, which uh, parallels the West Fork as you go towards Kingwood, uh, south of Forest Cove. Um, this was taken by a friend who I uh, interviewed later, and his house got flooded to a level of 27 feet. He built it 25 feet above the river, thinking that would be enough, and it wasn't. It flooded the bottom floor. Luckily, he could still live on the top two floors. But as he was evacuating, he took this picture of the light pole. That's one of the iconic images of the flood for me. You know, when you tell people how bad it was in Kingwood, all you have to do is show them this image, and they get it. Here's East End Park. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sedimentation today. The uh, uh, river dislodged so much sediment from the river banks, the river bed, and the sand mines upstream on both the west and the east forks that it uh, deposited that sand wherever it started, wherever the water started to slow down. Um, the ability of moving water to suspend sediment and gravel uh, depends on its velocity. And when it goes through forests like it did here, the friction of the forest slows it down and the sediment drops out of suspension. Um, you saw the same thing happen over on the, east, uh, on the West Fork by uh, River Grove Park, where we had to clean five feet of sand out of the parking lot. I found gravel um, on top of sand dunes above this boardwalk, which used to go over a beautiful wetlands area, by the way. Um, we used to call that Eagle Point because eagles would come in there and fish uh, all the time. You'd, you'd spot them. They, they nested in the trees nearby. And now they're all gone because of what happened during the storm. Um, there was a tremendous amount of erosion in general. Um, I flew over uh, the West Fork and the East Fork and uh, rented helicopters every month for several years, and I've amassed 33,000 pictures in that time. So much of my learning about this is through observation and interviews with people who were on the spot. 
Um, does anybody know what HVL stands for? Highly volatile liquids. So during the flood, these pipelines were undercut by rushing water. And you can see them sagging from the weight of the liquids that were still in the pipelines when I took this picture. Had those pipelines ruptured, the water would have gone straight into Lake Houston, which is a source of drinking water for two million people, including most of you in this room. Imagine that. Here's Kingwood High School. I mentioned how it got flooded to the second story. Here's the proof. These are the town center apartments in Kingwood. Notice the uh, rooftop of the SUV over there on the left. That tells you how deep that water was. And by the way, that was about two miles from the river. Now, let's talk a little bit about why the flood happened. And let me say up front, if you get 54 inches of rain in four days, people are going to flood no matter what, you know. So the fact that nature was a contributing cause in all of this is undisputed. I'm not arguing that. Um, it, it played a, uh, it precipitated everything that followed, no pun intended. But humans made it worse. And there are six ways that humans make it worse. This is part of your basic flood understanding. I've kind of put these things together over time. I've uh, put up over 2,000 posts since Harvey. Every day I'm researching and writing and photographing about this stuff. And these distill a lot of what I've learned. And by the way, I ran these by the former heads of the Flood Control District and Harris County Engineering. And the guy who was the head of engineering for 30 years said, this is the best explanation I've ever read of how this works. So listen closely. It starts with inaccurate predictions of future rainfall. Nobody is omniscient. We, we don't have crystal balls. We can't tell the future. We can only predict the future by what's happened in the past. Um, number two is conflicting development standards and building codes. And I'll explain each of, each of these in more detail as we go through. Uh, building too close to the threats. Upstream changes that undermine our assumptions about what we thought was going to happen. The difficulty of adapting downstream. You know, once people build homes and colleges and roads, you, you can't just lift them up 10 feet and say, okay, now we're safe again. It, it would just cost too much. It would be cost prohibitive. Um, and then there's the uh, historical unwillingness to fund flood mitigation at meaningful levels. Uh, did I skip number four there? Uh, the upstream changes that undermine our assumptions. As we're fixing things downstream, there are people upstream continuing to send water in ever-increasing volumes downstream. So it's like whack-a-mole. It's, it's a game of you know, offset that we're playing there. Now let's go into each of these and describe them in a little more detail. This uh, eye chart on the right is the Atlas 14 chart. That represents the new rainfall probabilities for Harris County, northern Harris County specifically, that were developed after Tropical Storm Allison in 2001. Since I've lived here for almost 40 years now, I've lived under three different sets of assumptions like this. There was the pre-Allison set, there was the post-Allison set, and now there's the post-Harvey set. So they keep on changing. Why do they change? It has to do with how they're determined. It's something called EVA. EVA is an arcane branch of mathematics called extreme value analysis. 
uh, a guy who grew up here in Kingwood, a young man not much older than, than you, uh, who got a PhD in mathematics, explained this to me. By the way, he now works, uh, he makes a million bucks a year working on Wall Street helping hedge funds understand these kinds of probabilities. So study hard. The, um, uh, but what EVA is, is they, they take extremely rare events in the past and they analyze the frequency of those to predict the probability and frequency of unknown events in the future. So by definition, they're working off extremely small data sets. And every time a new storm like Harvey or Allison comes along, it upsets the apple cart. It adds to their data set. It says, there's more that we have to learn about this stuff. We guessed wrong in the past. We need to increase the things, increase the, the rain, expected rainfall rates and actually decrease the intervals between storms. So what you see is that a thousand, when, when you look at these Atlas 14 tables, what you see is that a thousand year storm before Harvey is now a hundred year storm. That means instead of 0 0.001 probability every year, it's 0 0.01, you know? A huge difference there. And because the volume of rain is increasing along with the frequency, the floodplains are expanding. And the question is, how much? Well, FEMA has not released the new maps yet. They're still vetting the data. But uh, we have been told, uh, I, I'm the Harris County Precinct 3 representative to the uh, Community Flood Task Force, by the way. So I've gotten a chance to preview some of this stuff. We've been told that the floodplains will be expanding by at least 50% in most places. So if you bought a home, sort of say, at the edge of the 100-year floodplain, you're now gonna find yourself deep in it, and maybe even close to the floodway, because the floodway could become the 100-year floodplain, the 100-year floodplain could become the new 500-year floodplain. Everything is expanding, so more people are gonna be brought into the risky areas as this happens. Um, now, before I move on to the next slide, think back the people were building buildings like this under the old assumptions before we knew better. That's why we need to focus on what's happening upstream and make sure that they aren't sending more water downstream. Um, what we see when we look around uh, the seven county region is conflicting development standards and building codes. Um, I'll show you a slide a little later on that shows the variation in these. Um, but the reason for the variation is uh, we don't all share the same priorities. Some people are concerned about flooding. Other people are concerned about maximizing their property rights. You know, they own land in a floodplain and they want to sell it. They want to get rich. They want to retire off of that floodplain land. And so they convince their county engineers and their county commissioners that, well, if we do it the right way, it won't be a problem. But a lot of them try and cut corners later on, and I've documented a lot of those. Uh, the former county engineer, John Blount, proved uh, through high, that higher standards and more stringent building codes uh, reduce property damage 20-fold. Uh, many of those changes were implemented before Harvey, and they came back after Harvey and did a comparison study to surrounding properties, and that's how they made that determination. <clears throat> 
And yet people are still reluctant to adopt minimum standards that could protect people. And it's because of what I just talked about, this property rights versus public safety. And it's because of that, the, the conflicting standards, that you'll find lax regulation and spotty enforcement in many areas upstream from us. And they do that, they won't admit this, but through personal experience, I've found that they do this to attract development. Before I retired, I had a 20,000 square foot building on the Harris County, Montgomery County line on 3.4 acres. And the Montgomery County people put the hard rush on me. They said, build it over here. You can do whatever you want and your costs will be cheaper. And in fact, if you went to the East Montgomery County Improvement District website, uh, up until very recently, they may still have it on there, you'd find a video that says, come here, we have no rules. <laughs> wow, you know, talk about being brazen. Um, so this is what I meant by, you know, people can send it downstream in ever increasing volumes. They, and I'll tell you how they do that in a second here. I also mentioned building too close to flood threats. You're looking at a picture of Bray's Bayou. If you're not familiar with Bray's, it cuts south of downtown. It sort of parallels Buffalo Bayou. It cuts in from the west side and empties into the ship channel on the east side. Um, it goes past the medical center and uh, McGregor Park. Um, but along its length, you'll see uh, apartment buildings built right up to the edge of it like this and major streets. Now, if in the future they determine that they need to do some flood mitigation work here, like build a detention basin or widen the channel, how are they going to do it? You've got to buy out all these properties before you can even start. And this is typical of what you see as you fly around the county, especially inside of Beltway 8, where a lot of the population is concentrated. I mentioned upstream changes undermining downstream assumptions. I'd like to start out by telling you a personal story. Before I moved to Houston, this was in the early 80s, or maybe late 70s, uh, late 70s, I bought a house in Dallas on a, what's called Spring Creek up there. And uh, it was beautiful. It looked out over the Richardson Golf Course. You know, it was quiet, peaceful, tranquil. Tranquil had a lot of trees on it. We loved it. And I looked at the surveys. It was, uh, you know, an engineer certified that it was going to be two feet above the 100-year floodplain. The lender assured me that was enough. I bought the house, and shortly thereafter, the water started coming up to the back door with increasing frequency and increasing height, way past that two-foot level. And I said, whoa, what's going on here? I went to the city engineer. He got a commission started. They got the Army Corps of Engineers to come back out and resurvey the creek. And what they found was that because of one shopping mall built upstream from us that covered uh, 80 acres at the time and now covers about 150 acres with the surrounding buildings, the floodplain had changed. All that impervious cover was getting water to the creek faster. They didn't have any detention ponds built at this facility to hold the water back in a flood. As a result, the Army Corps told us that we were now 10 feet below the 100-year floodplain instead of two feet above it. Wow, that's a difference, <laughs> you know? And so on the, at the next rain, I looked out my back window and I saw a pickup truck floating down the creek. And I said, it's time to sell. You know, I, <laughs> my wife and I had, uh, a small baby at the time and, and another one about to be 
uh, do, and we just decided we didn't want to live with that kind of flood risk. So um, we moved to Houston, bought this house in Kingwood, and soon, uh, you know, Conroe became the fastest growing city in America, just like Plano was back then. And there are a lot of things going on up in Montgomery County. We're in Montgomery County right now, I think. And one of the things, one of the loopholes that Montgomery County allows for new developments is something called hydrologic timing. If a developer can prove that he can get his water to the river faster than the peak of a flood arrives, that's what this graph is about over here on the left, then he's not adding to the peak, so he doesn't have to build the tension according to Montgomery County rules. He doesn't have to hold any water back. Well, what does this do? It encourages every developer to get their water to the river as fast as they can in a flood so they have more saleable lots. Nobody wants to buy a home at the bottom of a detention pond. And that's what's driving a lot of the increased flood peaks that we see down here. You notice two lines on this chart, a red one and a blue one. The red one builds, this is for Braze Bayou, by the way, and it was developed after Tropical Storm Allison to illustrate how the peaking of floods on the river changed as a result of development. The red one is a pre-development hydrograph. It shows how the water built, and notice the slow, gentle curve. The blue one is a post-development curve. Because everybody's getting their water to the river faster, the peak builds higher and quicker, and the floods are more violent. That, I believe, is a large part of what's been happening in this area over time. But how do we adapt? Um, here's another picture of Bray's Bayou. Notice how all these apartments and, and shopping centers are built right up against the bayou. You know, this is why flood mitigation down there is so expensive. If you look at that pie chart on the right, the yellow area, actually the blue area, let's talk about that one first, the big light blue area, represents construction costs. The yellow one represents right-of-way acquisition costs. That's the property that the flood control district needs to buy before it can start construction. And notice that those two segments are almost identical. And the size of that yellow segment is driven by people building too close to the to threats, which lay, only later are recognized as threats. We don't have a safety margin built in. Combine that with a historical unwillingness to fund flood, flood mitigation, and you've got a recipe for risk. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. Right now, despite all the hype that surrounded Harvey, we are spending countywide more on hike and bike trails than flood mitigation in the Lake Houston area. And we were one of the most heavily damaged. Before the flood bond, Harris County Flood Control District often had to save up multiple years to build one detention basin. Now some people have interpreted that as being ignored by the flood control district, but the voters weren't willing to vote higher taxes to better control flooding. So that's what we're talking about. So, to sum up for this section, safety is a shifting target. We have changing estimates of rainfall, changing estimates of frequency, competing interests upstream and downstream, patchwork regulation with loopholes that allows people to get away with some things that other people wouldn't. It's hard to know what's exactly what's going on around you. Uh, all these new developments often try to cut corners. And then there are the mitigation efforts, uh, which often fall short because we don't have enough money 
So let's go on to the next part and do a mitigation update. Where do we stand on the things, the, the self-assignment that community leaders gave ourselves after Harvey? And I'll go through these. Dredging was probably one of the most obvious things, the, the most obvious improvements. We've spent well over $100 million on dredging to date, and we're headed for $200 million real fast. Uh, the goal is to increase throughput so that sediment dams, like the one you're looking at there, don't back water up. This sediment dam formed overnight during Harvey. I talked about sediment being carried in floodwaters and, and the velocity. Well, where the, the river meets a standing body of water, like Lake Houston, which you see in the background there, we're looking south towards the 1960 bridge, by the way, the, um, the sediment starts to drop out of suspension because you have different velocities. As it slows down, it just dumps all that sand that it's picked up on, along the way. And this uh, sandbar was actually seven or eight feet above the river level. So imagine how high the water was to get to the point where it could even drop water at that height or drop sediment from the water at that height. Just amazing. To date, this, this sandbar is gone now, thanks to the Army Corps. Um, they dredged four million cubic yards of sediment out of the West Fork between River Grove and this sandbar. Also notice the little islands like beyond the sandbar in the background. And if you look real close, you might be able to see one in the foreground that's just about to peek up above the water. What they found is that the water depth around this sandbar was about one foot deep. So as the water was coming down the river, it would hit blockages like this, and where is it going to go? Up and out into people's living rooms. Luckily, uh, Dan Huberty uh, has secured from the state $50 million to uh, help fund maintenance dredging to help ensure that things like this don't build up again in the future. Dredging is one of the bright spots. Uh, sand mining, upstream from where we're sitting, we have 20 square miles of sand mines along the East Fork. You can't see them unless you get up in the air because they're all closed off, they're gated off. Um, but one of the goals here was to affect sand mining regulations to reduce the amount of sand coming downstream. Those 20 square miles, by the way, between I-69 uh, I and I-45 represent a 20-mile reach of the West Fork. And so that makes the average width through there a mile wide, which increases the potential for erosion 33x, because the normal width of the river is about 160 feet. That white image you see on the top is the West Fork where it joins uh, Spring Creek. And I photographed that one day when I was flying over it and the helicopter and pilot and I said, whoa, what's that about? And we went upstream to uh, a sand mine uh, farther up by River Plantation. And we found out later on through the TCEQ that they had dumped 56 million gallons of sludge into your drinking water. Um, so that helped launch a major lobbying effort with the TCEQ. That's the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality, which regulates mining. And uh, just this year, early in the year, they adopted new regulations for sand mines. And in that, uh, they, for the first time ever, have minimum setbacks from the river, and it also specifies that they, need to be remain that they need to remain vegetated to help strengthen and stabilize those things. Um, but pipeline safety, which we discussed earlier, was not addressed in the new regs. Getting these things changed is hard, because just as hard as you're trying to change them, somebody else is trying to keep 
keep them the way they were. Sand traps. This was a compromise strategy that we focused on. Um, the goal is to reduce sedimentation. I read about these in an Army Corps study done in the Mississippi River where they dug trenches in the middle of the river allowing the sand to drop into it so that it wouldn't build up downstream and block navigation. Well, the way it got modified after a preliminary engineering review was to build a sand trap in this area that you see in the foreground of that curve. And basically it would be a trench, a rock line trench through that sandbar that would trap sand that might be coming downstream and allow the sand miners to come out and harvest that sand without paying a tax on it. And so it was an apparent win-win for everybody until people started saying, well, wait just a minute. You know, they didn't even study the area downstream where all the damage occurred. And by the way, is this just a form of subsidized river mining, which has been proven in other parts of the world, like uh, in the Mekong Delta, to be disastrous? Um, the environmentalists thought that it would open the door to river mining, so right now they're sort of studying what to do about their first study before they define their next study. And one of my biggest concerns was if it has to be next to a sand mine, then you only can do these things on the West Fork because Spring and Cypress Creeks don't really have sand mines to speak of. They do have a couple small ones, but nothing like these. Um, buyouts. Uh, these are a form of flood mitigation Basically, they're designed to eliminate future uh, flooding by just buying people's homes at the market rates and saying, okay, you get to move somewhere else now. You don't have to flood every time. Um, uh, this is one of the uh, uh, homes that I, uh, where I interviewed a lady down uh, in Forest Cove, and uh, they had to be rescued by boat also. It was a traumatic experience, to say the least. Um, she gladly took the offer, but one of the things they found when flood control started buying these out was that it wasn't so easy to find all the owners. Um, many had just fled their responsibilities, moved to another state or another country without leaving a forwarding address, and said, okay, it's somebody else's problem now. So the legal proceedings delayed the buyouts. They had to foreclose on them, and they finally just tore the last one down earlier, uh, about a month ago. It was a month ago today, as a matter of fact. Floodgates. Um, you hear a lot of people talk about these online. Uh, this was one of the things, one of the three main strategies that was outlined after Harvey. Uh, we wanted dredging to let the water get through without being blocked. We wanted floodgates to let the water out faster so it wouldn't back up. And we also wanted more upstream detention so it wouldn't come inbound as quickly as it did. The uh, uh, goal here is to somehow s balance the rates of the um, the gates on Lake Houston, which you see on the left, and Lake Conroe, which you see on the right. Lake Houston can release water at 10,000 cubic feet a second, but in a flood, Lake Conroe can release it 15 times faster. Wow. You know, you wonder why water built up? That's one of the many reasons. Um, now, uh, if we were able to lower water faster in advance of a storm on Lake Houston, it would enable a joint reservoir operations policy. But right now we're still studying what to do with adding gates on Lake Houston, so that study is on hold. Um, a big snag, the reason it's been on hold for so long and, and why they keep on studying new alternatives 
is because of something called the BCR. BCR stands for Benefit Cost Ratio. FEMA, if they're going to fund these things, wants to know that the benefits exceed the costs. Otherwise, why would you do it? You know, in their mind. Uh, this is sort of a continuation of the previous slide. So initially, they uh, identified seven or eight alternatives, and there were two or three alternatives on some of those. So I, I don't know exactly how many alternatives they examined, but they are trying to balance three or four different things simultaneously. One is the cost, the other is the benefit, safety, they don't want to flood people downstream just to help people upstream, and uh, also their work in terms of safety, they're working with brittle concrete, which was poured 70 years ago in 1952. Um, and there's some environmental risk to all this, too. There are some sensitive wetlands downstream that they're concerned about pre uh, preserving. Uh, so they've, they've got to look at all the alternatives and find the optimal, the, the single best alternative that balances all those things. They started out looking at uh, crest gates in the spillway. Crest gates operate off a piano hinge, like at the bottom. They go up and down like the lid on a piano would. And to do those, they'd have to chisel away the concrete on the dam for about, they, they looked at 500, 1,000, and 1,500 feet. And then, you know, level it off, somehow attach the crest gates to it, and then, you know, start building water up in the lake again. Uh, they abandoned that uh, thing because it cost twice as much money as they had from FEMA. The, they couldn't get the benefit cost ratio right. As you look around the lake, most of the homes were already built above the 100 year floodplain. But FEMA is using the old 100 year floodplain to configure or to calculate the benefits. So they're coming up with very little damages avoided is, is the issue there. Um, so now they're looking at adding tainter gates, which go up and down on a radial arm. Uh, they're kind of like the gates you see on Lake Conroe and capable of you know, releasing a lot of water real fast. Uh, they're looking at that for the eastern portion of the dam, which is the earthen portion just out of frame to the right there. And uh, uh, they're also looking at alternative funding that doesn't rely on FEMA so that they can uh, make this thing happen without having to justify the cost quite as stringently. In the meantime, we seized on a couple temporary strategies. One was Lake Conroe lowering. Uh, the goal here was to get more storage capacity for flood water in the lake. If the lake is down when the flood arrives, you don't have to uh, release quite as much water quite as fast. Um, but when they started lowering the lake, uh, they got pushback from Lake Conroe residents who own boats up there and didn't like the fact that they had to step down into their boats. So uh, they staged these massive rallies like the one you see here in this picture. Uh, the red t-shirts say, stop the drop. And uh, the white t-shirts represent the Lake Houston area people. They say lives over levels. Um, well, the, the Lake uh, Conroe, or the San Jacinto River Authority decided to you know, consider things. Uh, in the meantime, the LCA, the Lake Conroe Association, filed a lawsuit in district court it was dismissed with prejudice, which means they can't bring it back again. That's done. That's a legal tactic they can no longer use. So that's, that's good news. But in the, the meantime, the SJRA modified its lake lowering policy. And I'll show you that in the next slide. This bar graph down here represents the seasonal variation in the lake level of Lake Conroe. And uh, the, the dotted line at the top represents the target level uh, 
which is called the conservation pool. That would be the ideal level if they didn't sell water from the lake and if water never evaporated during the summertime. What you see here, though, is the results of water sales and evaporation. So the water level oop, rarely gets above uh, 200, and it often gets as low as about 199 and a half. The uh, Lake Conroe, uh, the idea here is, again, to avoid large releases. They've done a couple other things in the meantime. They've, uh, uh, they've, they've brought the new standards for lake lowering down to about where these seasonal levels are right now. So we're not really getting a whole lot of extra lowering out of this. But what we do get is a guarantee that the Lake Conroe levels won't rise above this when a flood comes along a day or two later. Um, they've also developed something called a reservoir forecasting tool and a flood early warning system up there. Uh, I mentioned earlier that their joint reservoir operations plan is on hold. Uh, the ideal here would be for both lakes to open their floodgates at the same time um, and, you know, let water out, but uh, they can't do that until we can release as fast as they can. Um, they've also tried to improve coordination with the city so people don't get surprised like they were in the last flood. And if you go to their website, you can see how they've already done that. Um, at the same time that we're trying to lower Lake Houston, or uh, Lake Conroe, we're also lowering Lake Houston. The goal here, again, is more storage capacity. Uh, so far, the lake has been lowered 20 plus times since Harvey. Uh, it's an effective strategy, but a risky one. Uh, the, the reason why is the gates are so small on Lake Houston that to achieve any appreciable lowering of the lake level, they have to start far in advance of the storm. And the storm can sometimes veer away before it gets to the lake. So they wind up wasting water in that case. It's an effective strategy, but risky for that reason. And it's also temporary until we determine whether we can get more gates on the lake to let the water out faster. I, I mentioned upstream detention. The San Jacinto River Authority did a San Jacinto River Basin Master Drainage Study. It identified 16 areas where they could uh, put upstream detention. The total cost of those, $3.3 billion. So to put that in perspective, that's three times more than the state has in its flood infrastructure fund. All had low benefit cost ratios, and the reason is because they're out in rural areas. People don't flood there right now. Um, so there are very few damages avoided. Uh, and that's why uh, Dave Martin is trying to hustle up some alternative funding by uh, talking to other sources that don't rely on the BCR. Uh, at the same time, the SJRA is looking at Birch and Walnut Creeks uh, to do a new feasibility study on those. They had the highest BCRs, and they're hoping that with additional study, they can find a way to bring the projects off without um, uh, going over the, the allowance. They've got to get at least 70%, uh, 0.7 uh, BCR. Subsidence is another thing we're dealing with uh, here in this part of the county. You may not think of this as a flood threat, and it's not in the short term, but it is in the long term. Uh, recently, a couple years ago, the Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District decided to eliminate, um, uh, decided to elect its board. And when they did, one of the first actions they took was to eliminate subsidence as a metric in something they call their desired future conditions. In other words, they're saying, we're going to allow groundwater pumping regardless of its impact on subsidence. 
And groundwater, since they did that, groundwater use has increased and at the current rate, uh, the Harris County, or Harris Galveston subsidence district that compiled this diagram estimates that it could increase to 3.25 feet at the county line where you're sitting right now and yet it would only be one foot at the Lake Houston Dam because it takes water that much longer to migrate that far underground. So basically what would happen if this comes to pass is that you would be tilting Lake Houston back towards this area. And that two feet above the 100-year floodplain that most people shot for when they built their buildings, well, guess what? That would disappear. You'd be flooding more frequently. So people need to be aware of this and get involved in that fight. Another thing uh, that many people focused on after Harvey was channel maintenance. They said, well, you know, water can't get to the river. It's backing up. This is a portion of the segment near Ben's Branch, near where I live. Uh, the goal was to restore the conveyance of the creek, which had been reduced to what they call a two-year level of service in this case. The ditches are built to a 100-year standard and it had been reduced through upstream sedimentation to two years. So that means you get a three-year rain and somebody's going to flood. Um, they have also completed maintenance projects on Taylor Gully, diver the Kingwood Diversion Ditch, Rogers Gully down in Atascacita, and a few whose names I don't recognize over on the far side of the lake. So that's good news. One very close to here is the Woodridge Detention Basin. This is in the Taylor Gully watershed. Uh, when Perry Holmes started to develop this in uh, 2019, they clear cut more land than they should have before they built the detention ponds. So sheet flow from 270 acres went straight into Elm Grove and North Kingwood villages and flooded 600 homes twice. Uh, after the second time, Harris County bought the property and flood control is studying what to do with it. In the meantime, they've started uh, excavating land where they know a detention pond will have to go. It's on a uh, kind of a, an iffy basis though. It's under something called an ENR contract. ENR contracts are called excavation and removal. They allow private companies to come in and take the dirt and resell it for a profit, and that's how they make their money. Taxpayers love it as long as they don't get flooded in the meantime. Um, but it gives us a head start on the excavation when the engineers finally figure out what they're going to do. As of last night, the Flood Control District told me they'd remove 55,000 cubic yards from that area out of a projected total of 500,000. So uh, they started this back in January. They've, they've got a ways to go yet. Uh, area drainage studies. Before anybody is going to fund a flood mitigation project, they want to study to prove that it's going to be worthwhile, and they want to know that it's going to help someone. So nothing gets done in the flood mitigation space without studies, oftentimes multiple studies. You have preliminary engineering reviews, uh, engineering reviews, and then you have construction engineering after that, uh, where they verify all the costs. Uh, here's how things lined up in the Lake Houston area. For reasons that only the Flood Control District knows and will explain. They, um, uh, they, they split the Lake Houston up, area up into four places. Uh, Kingwood, Huffman, Crosby, and Atascacita. The Kingwood and Huffman studies are done, and the Crosby and Atascacita studies just started earlier this year. So five years to start a study. And by the way, on the last one, it took them five months to issue the purchase order after the commissioners approved the money for the study. Uh, in terms of active flood bond construction, where does that put us? 
The goal here is to build the recommended, the improvements that those studies recommend. At this instant, there's $236 million worth of construction countywide. And a grand total of 2,000 of that is in the Lake Houston area. That represents 0.0008%. It's like less than a thousandth of 1% because of political priorities. Here's how it breaks down in a bar chart. You can see that Bray's is getting over $90 million, or close to $90 million. And the Lake Houston area is just a little blip over there on the right side of the chart. I mentioned regulation earlier. The Flood Control District hired a company to survey flood regulations in surrounding areas and also municipalities within those areas, including Harris County and then make recommendations to bring all of their regulations up to a consistent minimum level. And what you see is that about 40% of the people studied already changed their regulations. This is good news. About another 40% in the middle column um, delayed having the analysis done and haven't decided whether to do anything yet. And the ones over in the right-hand column, which is the remaining 20%, have decided to do nothing. And by the way, I might mention that Liberty County, um, Montgomery County, and Waller County, all upstream from us, are among those who have decided to do nothing. Although in fairness, I will say this, that since this chart was done at the end of July, um, Montgomery County uh, commissioners on August 23rd decided to update their drainage regulations. So they may adopt these minimum standards as part of that. That would be good news. Bridge underpasses are a consistent choke point in floods. Often, if you uh, look at aerial or satellite photos uh, of flooded areas, you'll see uh, the water behind bridge underpasses backed up. Uh, they're a choke point. Uh, thank goodness the city was able to clean out those uh, under Kingwood and North Park Drive in most places. Uh, they've cleaned out six to date, and I think they still have one or two more to do. Storm sewer clean out. Uh, they examined the storm sewers in 21 villages in Kingwood. They cleared 30 miles of drains and completed that project long ago in June of 2020. So that's good news too. But we still have a lot of new development going on upstream. If you don't believe me, drive up 59, take a right on 2020, and start driving through something called Colony Ridge. Uh, it's a 20,000 acre development. To put that in perspective, that'd be about 50% larger than Kingwood. It's right next to, uh, just east of Plum Grove. And the objective here is that through regulations, maybe we can prevent damage rather than mitigate it after the fact. You know, wouldn't that be wonderful? We wouldn't have to spend all that public money and we'd still be safe if we could just get everybody to play by the same rules. But not everybody does. Uh, the way this development was built without detention ponds and with straight line ditches that accelerated the flow of flood water. Uh, they managed to flood Plum Grove and wash out FM 1010, uh, which is still impassable five years after Harvey. And um, basically what the developer is doing is he's externalizing his development costs by putting them on the public, saying, you know, I don't care if I cause damage, you folks fix it. You know, it's your problem, not mine. You're downstream. So here's a summary. What happened? We got 20 feet of flood water that destroyed a community. Why? We weren't prepared. Uh, we had some self-inflicted wounds. The flood mitigation that we'd done prior to Harvey was underfunded and inadequate. And the mitigation since has been incomplete. It's far from done. I'd like to leave you with one last thought. Uh, 
I amazed even my wife with this one. Um, she's the world's most prolific reader, by the way. She's on her second time through the Library of Congress. Um, it's the parable of the five wise. Has, raise your hand if you've ever heard of this. One person, Jim. It was, this was a methodology developed by the man who founded Toyota. It's a form of quality control and root cause analysis. Basically, the premise is you never get to the root cause of a problem until you ask the question why at least five times. Well, with something as broad as Harvey, you can go down a lot of rabbit holes, but I'm going to give you an example of one, uh, how that works. It's only when you get down to that last level, he says, Mr. Toyota says, that you can typically get to something that you can affect that's actually going to do some good. Well, kind of like the butterfly effect, you know, the, the benefits will ripple outward and upward. And here's my example of the five whys. We flooded. Why? Well, sediment blocked the river. Why? Lack of controls on mining and development upstream. Why? Well, leadership has other priorities. Why? Lack of public awareness. Why? Now, we're down to something that I could affect. The mainstream media, when you answer that last why, the mainstream media are simply not investing the time and money to follow up on flooding and flood mitigation. It was hot after Harvey. It was at the top of everyone's priority list. Now we're in a drought. <coughs> See if you can find any coverage on local flooding in the mainstream media. So this was another blockage in the river immediately downstream of River Grove Park, which flooded six times before the Army Corps dredged this one out in a space of two months. Six times in two months. And since it was removed, River Grove has not flooded once. That's the kind of impact you can have if you get involved and you go down some of these rabbit holes and start asking the five whys. Find an area where you can apply your expertise and motivate the people around you to fix problems before people flood again. Thank you for your time. Be sure to follow us on our social media, like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.